Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. The uh, topic tonight on my thoughts is a topic called Make It Happen. Uh, there's an old anecdote that is told about a man who was very religious and be totally believed in God. It happened there was a flood in his town and everyone was warned to leave their houses and move to higher ground. He stayed in his house. <laughs> Soon the floodwaters were up to his front porch and a man came by with a canoe and offered him a ride telling him that the floodwaters were rising and he should climb into the canoe and save himself. Well, he said to the man, no thank you, I trust in God and he will save me. Well, the floodwaters continued to rise and now the water was starting to come through his front door. A speedboat comes by and the driver tells him to climb into the boat because the flood waters are still rising and that he may drown. <clears throat> he answers this man with the same words that he said to the man in the canoe. No, thank you. I trust in God and he will save me. Sure enough, the floodwaters continue to rise and now he is forced to go up to his roof and hang on to the chimney. He looks up and a helicopter is hovering above him. They lower a rope and they tell him to grab onto the rope and they'll transport him to safety. But he answers with the same words that he said to the man in the canoe and the man in the speedboat. No, thank you. I trust in God and he will save me. Well, as you can imagine, the man drowns. When he gets up to heaven, he's furious. He demands from the angel in charge to see God immediately. The angel tells him that God is in a meeting, but the man refuses to listen. He bursts into God's inner chamber. He cries out to God, I trusted in you. How could you let me die? <laughs> well, patiently, God turns to the man and says, what more could I do? First, I sent a canoe. Then I sent a speedboat. And finally, I sent a helicopter. It was up to you <clears throat> to make it happen. This is a world of action. In fact, the last word mentioned in the, that, that concludes the narrative of creation is, in the, he is the Hebrew word, la sot, to do. This is a world of action. God expects us to be partners with him in the creation of the world. We do so by changing the world, making it a better place, and even more so, by changing ourselves, making ourselves better people. Action. We all think about it and or talk about it, but how many of us actually turn our thoughts and words into action? If success came quickly and easily, then we would all be successful. However, that is not usually the case. Success generally comes with perseverance and hard work. If you want to be successful in life, well, you have to make it work. There are many obstacles that impede the road to success. Somehow people have come under the impression that the road to success is short and simple. When in reality, it's just the opposite. Many times it's long and arduous. One must be able to have their head in the clouds and at the same time, their feet on the earth. They must be able to dream, but at the same time, they must be firmly rooted in reality. <clears throat> they may be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. They need to be able to see the whole picture and yet not miss the small details. If you're asked the question of people who wants to be successful, well, I'm sure most people would raise their hands. But I think that many people <clears throat> have a misunderstanding of what it takes to be successful. For one, success usually entails dealing with other people, whether with, as employees, co-workers, suppliers, customers, forget about family and friends. And then there is the greatest challenge of all, hmm, dealing with yourself. So let us look into our instruction manual, the Torah, and see how it can help us to attain our mission in life and find true success. Now, the first example of perseverance found in the Torah has to be in God Almighty himself, as it states in the first words of the Torah, Bereshit bara Lukim, in the beginning God created. Well, he made it. That's what it says, bara, he made the world. He made it happen. And as I mentioned earlier, the last word in creation was lasot, to do. God expects us to continue his act of creation. 
He expects all of mankind to make it happen. No one made it happen more than Noah. He spent 120 years building the ark. Well, I would call that true dedication to the job. Because of his dedication and work ethic, he was able to save himself, save his family, and save all the living creatures in the world. Now, after building an ark for 120 years, <clears throat> he had both the expertise and had built up the perseverance to rebuild a new world. He made it happen. He didn't wait for it to come to him. Avram Avinu, Abraham our father, was the first person to spread monotheism throughout the world. He never gave up his mission, even after Nimrod had thrown him into a fiery furnace. At God's command, he leaves his father's house and travels to the place that God showed him. Once there, he didn't wait for guests to come to his tent. He pitched his tent on the road. He did so, so as to be a convenient stopover for wayfarers to rest and have a good meal. While they were enjoying their meal, he would tell them about the one and only God in the world, and then he would ask them to say grace, thank God for the hospitality that they had achieved, pardon me, received. If they agreed, good, then there was no charge. Or if they refused to bless God, then Abraham, Abraham would present them with a large bill that they would have to pay. He brought God to the people. He didn't wait for the people to come to God. Avraham, he made it happen. The Torah tells that Avraham, our father, dug three wells and the Philistines plugged up all of them. Yitzhak Avinu, Isaac, our father, did not accept what the Philistines had done to his father, and so he re-dug the wells, and this time they were not plugged up. In addition, he dug a fourth well that survived, and he called it Be'er Sheva, the seventh well. He didn't accept what the Philistines had done. He made it happen. He redug the wells. When it came to his eldest son, Asaph, he didn't give up either. He kept the relationship alive and warm, vibrant. He was highly instrumental in Asaph being a better person, a much more spiritual person than Asaph had ever intended to become. Yitzchak made it happen. Yaakov, our father, was told by his parents that it was time for him to get married. So he traveled a great distance to Lovan's house in Haran to find a wife. He made it happen. While he was there, he became wealthy. We read in the Torah that he tells Lovan, his father-in-law, that he worked for him day and night under all types of difficult conditions. His wealth was not an accident. He made it happen. On his return journey to his father's house, he avoided a bloody confrontation with his older brother, Asa. How? By recognizing and acknowledging that his brother may have had some legitimate grievances against him. He was proactive. He didn't wait for Asa to confront him. Yaakov sent many, Asa many gifts even before their meeting. Rather than present all the gifts at once, what Yaakov did is he told the shepherds to distance one herd from the next so as to make each gift seem even more impressive. Then, when they finally did meet face to face, Yaakov bowed seven times to show his respect to his older brother. Instead of battling with each other, they kissed and hugged each other. But why? Because Yaakov made it happen. We see the same scenario with Yosef. He went out to see the brothers. When he was sold as a slave, he became an overseer of all the possessions that his master Potiphar owned. When he was falsely accused of attempted rape of his master's wife, he was incarcerated, then he was thrown into a pit. Even in prison, he was once again put in charge of everything that happened in the prison. But why? Because he made it happen. While he was in prison, he noticed that two of the prisoners, the king's butler and his baker, seemed troubled that day. He approached them and he asked if he could be of any assistance. They both told him of a dream that they had dreamt the night before and that their dream had caused them some concern. He asked both of them to relate their dream to him, which they did. He interpreted their dream and as he had foretold it, so it was. The butler was reinstated to his previous position and the banker and the baker was hung. 
After interpreting the butler's dream, he asked the butler to remember him to Paro in the hope of procuring his freedom. In all these situations, he was proactive. He made it happen. Then when he stood before Paro and interpreted Paro's dream, he did so with confidence and authority, all in the name of God. Yosef told Paro that the dream indicated that he should choose one individual to oversee the bounty of the good years. That person should store and distribute the blessings of the seven years of plenty in silos throughout the country so that the Egyptian people would not starve during the seven years of famine. Yosef's interpretation made Paro realize that there was no one wiser whom he could choose to implement Yosef's advice. No one, no one but Yosef himself. Yosef made it happen. The whole scenario that occurred with Yosef and his brothers coming to Egypt was orchestrated by Yosef. He recreated his dreams since he saw them as prophecies, not really dreams. He put himself personally in charge of all the food that was sold by the Egyptians during the famine. He was hands-on, which is why he was able to know exactly when his brothers came to Egypt for food. So all the events that led to him finally revealing himself and bringing his father and family down to Egypt were all his doing. He made it happen. And did Paro's daughter, Basia. She was bathing in the Nile when she looked up and saw Moshe's cradle floating in the water. Though it seemed impossible to reach his cradle, still, she reached out her hand. Even when it seemed highly improbable, she made it happen. We read that Moshe Rabbeinu Moses, our teacher, when he was a prince in the house of Paro, went out to see his brothers. This is when he sees the Egyptian overseer beating a fellow Jew. He saw that no one, no one was coming to the aid of the victim. And so he killed the Egyptian. He made it happen. When he comes to Midian, he meets his wife, his future wife, Sipporah. Yisro's daughter at the well. She and her sisters were being harassed by the shepherds. He beats off the men and then waters all the sheep. After these events, he marries Sipporah. He made it happen. God chooses him to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and to bring them to the promised land. Why was he chosen? Moshe shepherds Yisro's sheep. One day a lamb broke away from the flock and Moshe chased the little lamb for seven days. When the lamb finally stopped running, it was at an oasis. It was thirsty. Instead of showing anger at the sheep, Moshe picked up the little lamb and carried it back on his shoulders. That is when God saw, pardon me, that's when Moshe saw the vision of the burning bush. God saw Moshe's compassion for the little lamb, and so God said to him, I want you to shepherd my flock. Moshe, he made it happen. When the children of Israel made the golden calf, God wanted to destroy all of them. God told Moshe he would start a new nation that would originate from him. Moshe refused. He told God, forgive them. Moshe said, if you don't forgive them, then remove me from the book that you have written. God forgave them. Why? Because of Moshe, he made it happen. We also read in Pirkei Avot, chapter 1, Mishnah 12, Hillel stated that one should be a disciple of Aaron the high priest, who was a lover of peace and a pursuer of peace. He loved people and brought them near to the Torah. The Medrash tells us that when Aaron would see a husband and wife or two friends arguing, he would try to bring peace between the parties and bring them both together again. He would tell each party, how the other person was so sorry and upset that there was a rift between them. Afterwards, when the two parties would meet, well, they would embrace each other and reconcile their differences. Aaron, he made it happen. We find in the Talmud, it states in the Gemara in Sanhedrin 72a, that if someone wants to kill you, then you should get up early and kill him first. Turning the other cheek <laughs> is a Christian concept. If you allow your attacker to strike you first, you may not be able to recover. We as Jews believe in being proactive. Make it happen. 
We saw the scenario played out in 1967 during the Six-Day War. The State of Israel was under fear of attack by seven Arab nations. Knowing they could not sustain a defensive war, they planned and executed a preemptive strike against their enemies. Their action brought about a quick and decisive resolution to a dangerous conflict in the Middle East. In addition, all of Jerusalem, the Western Wall, and the Temple Mount were now all under Israeli sovereignty. They made it happen. There are many examples in the Torah that each of us to teach us not to wait for life to come to us. If we want to succeed in life, we must be aggressive partners together with God Almighty in this world. Success does not come to those who wait. It belongs to those who make it happen. We have just celebrated the holiday of Hanukkah, a story about a small band of zealots who decided enough is enough, and they took on the mighty Greek empire, and they won. They made it happen. They rededicated the temple and lit the menorah with one cruise of oil, knowing that there was only enough oil, pure oil, to burn for one night. But they lit it anyways. God looked down at his children, and he smiled. He allowed the flames to burn for eight days. Eight, the number that alludes to that which is above this world, just like a circumcision, which we perform on a male child on the eighth day after his birth. A ritual which connects this world to heaven above. They touch God's heart. They made it happen. Think of Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Motor Company, who went bankrupt five times. Or Milton Snavely Hershey, the founder of Hershey Chocolate, one of the largest producers of chocolate worldwide, who also went bankrupt five times. Even Walt Disney faced many setbacks and failures before he attained his success. We see that they didn't wait around for success to knock at their door. No, they made it happen. I think that at moments when things seem to be the most difficult, such as we are experiencing in our present time, now more than ever, we need to be proactive. We need to make it happen. Happiness and success are conscious choices that we must make. If we wait for life, i.e. even God, to make all of our decisions, then just like the man in our anecdote, we will drown. We need to decide that we want to be happy and successful in life. To achieve that goal, we need to reach out and grab them. We can't wait for them to come to us. For if we do press to procrastinate, we may well lose our opportunity for all the good that life has to offer. Make it happen. I would like to end this thought with a story about the famous virtuoso violinist, Yitzhak Perlman. He had contracted polio as a child, and he was forced to wear leg bra braces and to walk, supported by crutches. He gave a concert in New York City, and no sooner had he completed the first few bars of the solo performance when one of the strings of his violin snapped loudly, making a sound much like that of a gunshot. Still, it was still early in his performance. Perlman could have stopped the concert and fixed his violin. He did not. He waited a short minute and once again signaled the conductor to continue from where they had left off. With only three strings left on his violin, Perlman was able to improvise the score in such a way that he managed to complete the whole concert, playing with passion and artistry. When he finally finished, the audience jumped to their feet and cheered him with great enthusiasm. They realized that they had been privy to a stroke of brilliance, an extraordinary demonstration of human skill and genius. You know, when the crowd quieted down, the master spoke. You know, he began, I could have changed the string, but it is the artist's challenge to make beautiful music with what he has left. Hmm. He made it happen. And with that advice, let us focus our attention on bringing Mashiach Tsukenu. Let's make it happen now. I want to thank you all for attending. I'm going to wish you and your family, again, happiness, health, and uh, success. Again, God should bless you only with good. Um, have a Shabbat Shalom, and again, once again, thank you for attending.